So you're from Long Island. Five one six, man. Where? You couldn't wait. You couldn't tell based on the, or you could. Uh, Co- the uh, accent. Not really. I don't know. I guess uh, it sounds like us. Yeah, it's a uh, uh, Comac. It sounds like us. Comac. Okay. Very cool. When did, uh, what, what about yourself? Wait, you went to Comac. What's the high school in Comac? Comac High School. Comac Josh and I are from Merrick. Oh, yeah. Perfect. We're from Merrick, and we live in Merrick again. We moved back. You're core five one six. We're like mm-hmm. exactly. So I'm a five one six. Then moved to nine zero eight Jersey. Hold on, Comac is five one six. Now it's six three one. one. You're not but, you're six three one. Get out of here. But first of all, but if you this go, this guy's claiming. Yeah, come on, five one six. Come on. No, but original three, five one three. Original five one six. Get your own area code. And then six three one. But I still I still oh, identify. Oh, it was five one six. Okay. I you still identify. I, I still identify with the five one six. Six three one. Six three one ultimately shortchanges Eastern Long Island, in my opinion. So I don't it's even controversial. I don't even acknowledge the existence of Eastern Long Island past Melville. Oh, there's stop bla- there's it. Blackstone Steakhouse stop and then nothing else until the Hamptons. No, we- <laughs> I'm sorry. That's how I feel. I don't even know why there were exits off the highway. Dude, Dan LaRose is right outside. I know. I'm just kidding. Uh, all right. So we're so we're basically uh, you're a first time guest. We're so excited to have you. The timing is incredible. Everyone's writing articles about you right now. You're kind of having a moment. Look, I think there's what's de- going on with that. Can we talk about that? Like you're you're on fire right now. Look, I think we we talk about tech in a way that I think uh, many I think retail and many people you know that are not even in the institutional community identify with. whose way. In terms of me and my team. The royal way. Because ultimately, we, by covering tech since the late 90s, we try to put it in a way that people understand. So if I'm on the street, if I'm traveling, someone comes up to me, they're like, hey, I learned so much from you about AI, about Microsoft, about Apple. How great does that feel? Do you love that? Look, that's, that to me, it's like a win the lotto. Because I feel like, I mean, I'll give you a story. Like I was in Greece and some guy came up to me in Crete and he's like, because of you, I invested in Tesla and, and it's changed my life. Wow. So to me- What's better than that? That, that it, it, look, it's part of the reason why I do what I do, right? I mean, you know, in working in the institutional community, you know, since the late 90s here, especially the last four or five years, having more exposure to retail because Webbush has a huge retail presence. It's been a breath of fresh air for me, especially in the tech revolution. And I think it's taking complex things, especially with so many of the bears yelling fire in a yeah. crowded theater year after year. You know, like we always say, you're not going to find these technologies in a spreadsheet in your 10th floor on Park Avenue. You got to be out there in 3 million miles, air miles. That's, I think, been our edge. Who's we- Wedbush for our listeners that don't know who that is? So Wedbush, institutional firm, as well as retail, been around, based L- out of LA. LA, LA based. Based. Anyone yeah. in LA knows the, the Wedbush building, been around since 1950s. And I think it's a company that has built a reputation where we've really built ourselves from West Coast to now national, to now international, mm-hmm. where, where we've built out a lot in Asia as well as in Europe. And I've always, my whole career has always been in mid-market firms, FBR, Wedbush, because someone like myself, it's like, I feel like at firms like that is where I've been able to thrive rather than being put in a little box. Right. T- tell, did you tell Dan about the glasses that you were talking about at lunch? Oh, so I got my first- By the way, Dan, throw your headphones on, please, if you don't mind. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I got my first look in the wild of the Meta Ray-Bans, and a friend of mine was wearing them. Uh, shout to Bryn Talkington. So Bryn comes up to the New York Stock Exchange today. You know Bryn? Okay. Bryn's a good friend. Amazing, yeah. right? So she's wearing the um, Ray-Bans, and she comes up to me, and she's like, I just took a picture of you. So I'm like, all right, let me see it. It looks like it was taken with an iPhone. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. And she's like, put these on. I put them on. The glasses start answering my questions immediately. What's five plus five? What's today's date? What's for What's lunch? the temperature? Well, dude, so what's for lunch? And the and the glasses uh, jumped off my head and ran. <laughs> so, uh, so but like she's saying, like imagine somebody comes up to you and is speaking another language, and the glasses are just in your ear telling you what they're saying. That's what that's where well, we're going. Well, that's what see everyone like, with Vision Pro. Everyone views it as oh, thirty five hundred dollars. Who's gonna buy? Two years from now, those are gonna be sunglasses for twelve hundred dollars. I totally it, agree with you. So, so it goes back to. When when Apple came out with AirPods, everyone's like, if they sell 5 million AirPods in a year, that would be ridiculous. Mm. At peak, they sold 98 million. So it just speaks, look, it speaks to why 
many in this community. You talk about identifying with a lot of people globally because on the Wall Street side, many just sit there in their spreadsheets. Looking yeah, why is this 30 times earnings? Looking at valuation yep. in their 10th floor on Park Avenue or going to Metro North. Discounting and they, and those cash flows. Do, do, they love the DCF. And they've missed every transformational tech stock the last twenty a, years. It's a. It's almost like um. It's almost like a per, like a personality type, and the people that get the jobs doing what you do, tend not to be creative, True. tend not to be outgoing. You're running around the world meeting with the people that are using this technology, and they're looking at uh, valuation versus a peer group in black and white, and it's not that they will never be right. There are moments where tech mm -hmm. uh, gets gets sold off on valuation or whatever, but those are like stepping stones along the way to this transformation that you're paying attention to. And that's been our edge. I think yeah. over the decades, like that's been our edge, and and obviously on you know on social media engage with many because we were able to do the work that if a quarter and if a company gives conservative guidance, stocks off five seven percent. We've done the work with channel customers to know this is a blip. It's a double table. Oh, that's pounder. interesting. So not just on the rallies, but on the sell-offs, adding that value of you could ignore this. Exactly. And that's why and that's always been all right. That's the work that we do. And we've built up the trust out there. And just like on the macro, guys like the GOAT, Tom Lee. And but but we've been able to do it in tech in a way to identify the themes, the winners, where valuation is not going to capture. I'll just give you an example. Microsoft, if we talk to Microsoft partners and they say for every $100 of cloud spend, we believe there's an incremental 35 to 40 of AI spend. You throw that through to numbers next two, three years, Microsoft's a $4 trillion mark cap if they're 50% right. Wow. So when I look at a name like Microsoft, I don't just sit there looking at historical PE on my DCF spreadsheet getting caught up with the haters in the group think that, you know, we've been supporters of Microsoft since Nadella and it's trying to understand, you know, what I view is maybe it's a forest through the trees, especially in yeah. tech. Yeah. But so if as an analyst, you have to look at both. You have to know the trees, but then you also, I think, have to work a little bit harder, take a step back and appreciate the forest. Th that's right. exactly. And, 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 that. and also like covering tech for so many years, I feel like, we have, we're almost a conduit of information. You have a pretty good sense when something's a, you know, huge bear, all the institutions are short and, you know, like relative to sentiment. So it gives you sometimes a really good sense from an institution retail perspective that, you know, setups and just general sense out there and also try to be a calming force as well. Right. I mean, there's I, I, many people that are analysts. Let's start, let's, I'm going to hold you. Let's start the show. Nicole, Nicole's going crazy. She just wants to start the show. <laughs> All right, Nicole, what show is it? Today's episode of The Compound in Front is sponsored by Dimensional ETFs. That's right, Michael. For decades, Dimensional has helped move the investment industry toward more transparent, data-driven solutions for investors. Their founders contributed to the invention of index funds. Shout to shout to Kenny French. That's Gene right, Fama, Kenny French. And David the firm Booth. broke new ground in offering small cap investing as a diversifier, pioneering factor investing. Did and you know that? I did I know that. And more recently, they've had tremendous success with their ETF since launching in 2020. They've been the fastest growing ETF issuer. They now offer 38 of them, spanning from global equity, global fixed income and global real estate markets. Dimensional builds portfolios that emphasize dimensions of the market that research shows have higher expected returns. Their low-cost diversified investment solutions are in many ways similar to index funds, but go a step further in that they are more systematic in pursuing higher expected returns. To learn more about the dimensional difference, visit dimensional.com. Episode 125. Keep my music going. This is important, okay? I want to shout out all the listeners, all the viewers. We are doing ridiculous numbers with the show. We are regularly breaking into the top 10 and sometimes the top five 
investing category podcasts in America. All over the world, we're, we're coming. We're not there yet, but in America, we have, we have arrived. What's up? Give me a count on that. You don't, seem that. you don't seem as excited as I do. No, I'm just still digesting lunch. We had a yeah. monster. We just had a crazy monster lunch. lunch. And that's part of the charm of the show. Yeah. Uh, but today is going to be a really, really exciting show. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I didn't even realize how beautifully timed it is until this week. We have, all right, take us down before I start uh, freestyling. We have a man on fire with us today. Dan Ives is a managing director and senior equity research analyst covering the tech sector at Wedbush since 2018. Dan has been a tech analyst on Wall Street for over 20 years, makes frequent appearances on CNBC, Bloomberg, NBC, CBS, The New York Times, and so many more outlets. You've seen him. If you're following him on social media, he is all over the world. He is meeting with some of the preeminent people in tech on Wall Street, hanging out with Tom Lee, hanging out with us. We're so thrilled to have you here. Welcome to The Compound and Friends, your very first episode of the show. Thank it's you so much for coming. It's great to be here. And I, no, I was super excited to be here, and thanks for having me. Of course. Now, I don't really know your career backstory prior to Wedbush, so like, kind of bring us up to speed. How did you become uh, Dan Ives? Sure. So I grew up in Long Island, 516, and uh, ultimately went to Penn State, we are, and from Penn State finance background, did corporate finance for a few years, got my MBA, University of Maryland, and then started FBR really in the, in the late 90s. So in the tech boom- Friedman Billings Ramsey. Friedman Billings Ramsey. I it got bought yeah, by okay. B. Riley. That's right. And we were, we were at the forefront of the tech boom in the late 90s, Dulles Toll Road, AOL, MicroStrategy. So I started off as an associate. I feel like it was you guys and Thomas Wiesel. It, as well as Robbie Stevens. Robbie Stevens. Okay. So, RIP. So a lot of it was, I get there, I don't have no tech background. I start as an associate and I recognize pretty quickly, like, the only way that I'm going to learn this is just build the biggest network possible. Yeah. So like I went to every user conference you could ever imagine, built a huge Rolodex. And then ultimately, as I started to cover stocks as a senior analyst, 2002, 2003, I built a strong presence from an institutional perspective because when you're also in mid-market firms like a, like an FBR, a Wedbush. You have to have an edge. The name well, of the firm is not going to get you in that's the door. Exactly. It's, it's more about you building your own brand, yeah. not the actual bank. That's right. And I think we started to build a huge presence specifically in software, cybersecurity. And then it really morphed into our calls on Apple, you know, with the iPhone and then betting big on Musk and Tesla back in, you know, in 2010, 2011. And you start to build more and more of a presence, more of a following, because I think investors recognize we're someone that's not just going to downgrade a stock because they missed the quarter. We're not going to get into a group think. And I think that's been able to differentiate us and also... Look, traveling the globe, three million air miles, we didn't do it by accident, right? It was like, we felt like we're not going to find the technologies and the trends in our spreadsheets, DCF, or in a 10th floor of an office building so, in New York City. So I want to back up a little bit. Betting big on the iPhone and then on Tesla, both of those things right now, with the benefit of hindsight, seem obvious. Like, of course, Tesla is going to be transformative. Sure. Of course, the iPhone is going to be a $200 billion business. But of course, in the early going, absolutely nobody believed that. And you you probably didn't even believe that, but you all you had to do is believe a little bit more than other people. And it was enough because those are two of the greatest stock market stories of the last well, hundred years. The BlackBerry iPhone debate was a real thing for a long okay, time. Yeah. So, so let's go to that. So let's go back to 07, 08. So financial crisis happens. Everyone's like, this is just the next BlackBerry. Actually, BlackBerry is going to crush that. It's a, it's a one iPhone. No one's they don't even have a their, keyboard. No one's giving up their keyboard. So no one's giving up. And at yeah. that time, it's like financial crisis comes. That's it. And BlackBerry Messenger. And BlackBerry Messenger, Nokia. It was also a good example. Was like with Apple, our view is like it was the services. It was yeah. that they were going to be able. Even Earl, like there were no services yet. But it was the concept that they were going to do what Nokia and BlackBerry did not do. They were going to be able to build a services and monetization that was going to ultimately be the key to Cupertino. But at the time, I mean, there were the types of hate that I'd get being bullish on those names, 
when Nadella took over Microsoft saying that he was going to transform into a cloud play. I'd be in meetings, people like, you might be the dumbest person <laughs> I've ever met. And I'm like, and again, I never take things emotionally. I could care less. I just view it like, look, these are our opinions. We feel real confident in the work we do. You could be, of course, you could be wrong. and But we felt just from a trend perspective that we were going to get we were going to bet big on what was their, But what was their argument? Their argument was this is the way things are and they're probably not well, going to change. Well, Apple also only had an exclusive with AT&T at the time exactly. for so, years. So it was the oh, AT&T exclusive. That's and right. then it was the view that once you have an iPhone, people ultimately are not going to upgrade. It was about the BlackBerry, the other sort of smartphone at the time. It wasn't obvious 15 years ago. And, and, and I'd yeah, say- To no one. Yeah. But it wasn't right. even obvious- even if you go back to 2014, 2015, at that point, our whole argument was the services business could be worth a trillion or more. But even at that point in time, they were competing with Samsung heavily. Exactly. Uh, People thought that Android, Samsung was going to, and the droids, that Samsung was going to flip the, uh, the Apple. And Josh, what I would do is I would literally like, I would sit outside 57th Street for like a whole day. Just talk to Apple users. So a lot of it, like the work that I did. Oh, by the park? Like by in the front of the pyramid. Yeah. So, right, so yeah. the, the main Apple store on 57th. So a lot of it was like, I just would do work. I'd be traveling somewhere and I'd just go to an Apple store and stay there for like three hours just talking to people. Now, that was something like a typical institutional salesperson. Like, I can't make a call on that. That's fine. It was all part of our, like, building a sort of— confirm the other work that you're doing. Exactly. But you know what's funny? So by the time it was apparent that Apple had won the phone wars, that they were the dominant winner, they were already at, whatever, $500 billion in market cap. And then the bear case became valuation, all That's that bullshit. And this is—I mean, bullshit in hindsight. And then this is before all of the other categories, before services was 25% of the business, before the AirPods, before, the, before everything else. Exactly. And it was just one thing after the other. Because ironically, the biggest move for Apple, it wasn't necessarily zero to 500, but all the battles from 07 to 15. It was from 15 to current, the 500 billion to 3 trillion. It was the re-rating on the services, the mm -hmm. understanding what was yeah. going to happen with accessories there. And I think, but that's a good example of like, the, the, just like our Tesla thesis, we've always viewed it as a disruptive technology company. Many have viewed it as an auto company. You should trade. I was like going to say the other guys covering this Jonas at uh, Morgan Stanley, but then everyone else who's an auto analyst. But, that, but how that's, could they possibly like the stock? But getting back to Apple, so you have to know how to value your companies because Apple used to trade like a hardware. Company. Twelve to sixteen, uh, right? And company, it was yeah. back on the cash. It was at eight times because it was a hard. It was a hard. Look, company. and at that point, my Shih Tzu could have told you: you buy it at twelve times, and at sixteen times, you sell it at the end of the cycle. But then, ultimately, as it played out, our view is on a services side. It was some of the parts. Mm. The some of the parts thesis was our view on Tesla, was the view on Microsoft, as Nadella, the tactician, was building out, and it's really the view of Nvidia with the Godfather of AI. What's been happening? How I ultimately view that as a some of the part story. Uh, we got to talk about the glow up. So, do you know what this is? I have no idea. You know what a glow up is? Nope. No? no. Nicole, what's a glow up? She's rolling. Are you rolling your eyes? Somebody ugly becomes. All right. Well, no, that's not what we're going to say. Uh, the glow up is like you're a Wall Street analyst, but now you're like the hot, you're like the hottest analyst oh, on the like, street right like he's now. He's glowing up. Like he, nobody's like, yeah. first of all, Aviator Nation. <laughs> Killing it. Look at the shirt. Is that Madras? What's going on? Yeah, I got this in Italy. But you're a sneaker collector too? I yeah, was New Balance. Big, big sneaker. Kicks are, kicks oh, are, that's AI. That's yeah, AI. Oh, not AI. 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 Your, uh, your sneaker game is fierce in every. All right. There's like a glow up going on. Ooh. Do you have a stylist? No, so I'm I don't. I'm not with you. I'm dead but, serious. But look, it goes back. Like in, I was in sixth grade in Long Island wearing green jabos. Yeah. So the point is like. You were always slaying. And Cavarici. You, you were slaying before people were so slaying. So I was, I was, look, I was playing chess. I was playing <laughs> well, checkers. Was you just give me one of these? That's right. But look, that's why when you grew up in Long Island. Yeah. I think. It, yeah, but I, had look, the, I had the Z Cavaricis every color. What's up? Z Cavs. Z Cavs and, and Jabo. Those every are, color. Those. The, waist, the waist was so high. I had to unzip the fly to blow my nose. You uh, were. <laughs> What's up? All right, wait a minute. They did a profile of you at Seeking Alpha uh, last week. Did you know this was coming out? Yeah, so I saw that. This is hot shit. You're like, uh, that's what I mean. You're like, you're the man of the moment. So the gist of all this is we're in this transformative era of tech. 
you are one of the few people that is recognizable, um, like recognizably associated with uh, the biggest tech stocks now. You have been supporting uh, the investing in the investing mm-hmm. in these stocks for a moment. I'm trying to like phrase this in yeah. such a way. You're not cheerleading the the companies or the stocks. People just when they see you, they know that this is your area of expertise. But it's also a calming force, right? So in other words, like when you have the typical Academy Award moves first two weeks of the year, downgrades of Apple, fire in a crowd theater, you you need to be sometimes a calming force to handle whether institutional and retail. When stocks are getting hit on 10-year macro geopolitical people freaking out, it's more of a steady hand too. And that's, look, and that's also why like on social media, I'm so out there too, because I also want, like, as I do work in the field, I let everyone know what I'm seeing. Yeah. So this is, this is from the Seeking Alpha profile. We feel a responsibility to handhold investors through the ups and downs of the tech market. We're needed most when things are falling apart. When I go to the depths of COVID in March and April 2020, that's where we handheld clients and tech investors through an unprecedented time. Our view back then was to basically buy tech stocks, and it's going to be short-lived, and these were golden opportunities. End quote. The reporter says that proved to be a good call. Since March 2020, Apple and Microsoft are up more than 200%, while Google has gained more than 150%. It's not that everything you say works out. It's that directionally, you have given people the right guidance at, at pretty difficult times. Yeah, I think that That's would be fair. the best way to put it. And, okay. and through like, it's also betting on the right subsectors. Like for cybersecurity, if names like Pow Out do get cr- it was being like, this is a golden age. Don't worry about the haters, the naysayers. You own it. It's a DTP, a double table pounder. It's easy to get bearish when the stocks fall 30%. It's hard to stay bullish. No doubt. But that's why, like, I sat next to an economist for a decade, and every day showed me some Sri Lankan currency blowout, which meant the market was going to, you know, ultimately implode. And I'd be like, okay, do you want Starbucks or not? I'm just (laughs) saying, like, it's easy to get caught up in there, and that's why I stick to my – it's, like, process-oriented. No different than the goat Tom Lee. I want to ask you about CES. So as I I was saying to you before – I was surprised at the degree to which Wall Street seems to be paying attention to CES this time. And I understand it's because everybody now wants to get a look at the new AI stuff Mm. coming down the pike. It's called the Consumer Electronics Show, but you made the point earlier that most of the AI stuff doesn't even get seen by the consumer because it's enterprise level. Tell us what your impression of the show was and what was like the coolest stuff that you saw. Yeah, just got back last night. I mean, I'd say it's the biggest CES that I've seen. Probably, it's probably go back to 97, 98. Go every year? Yeah. So, if How you, many people were there? 130,000. What? But, but the most important thing about this CES is it's not fringe. It's the friends you made along the way. It's the friends you made along the way. Okay. Okay. Yeah, obviously, you know, a good, a good natty party, national championship Monday night. That's right. Go blue. But but really what ended up happening is is that you try to understand the use cases. And this is not necessarily like robots, flying cars. It's trying to understand what the use cases for AI are. And that's why this was one. The mainstream technology is here. You're seeing the use cases play out, which is why we believe this is an AI revolution. It's not develop, it's not in development. It's in the market now. It's in the market. And that's okay. why what we're gonna start to see. First, what we believe will be the first three to six months of the year, you're going to start to see it from the godfather of AI, Jensen NVIDIA. You'll okay. see it from the Dell when they report earnings on the co-pilot. That's tip of the iceberg. Now the second, third, fourth derivatives start to come through, rest of tech, from enterprise to consumer, which is why we believe the new tech bull market's begun. I have a question. So you said that you believe AI will comprise 8 to 10% of IT budgets in 2024, up from less than 1% mm-hmm. a year ago, which is kind of wild. Are we going to see a company that we don't know about today be a trillion dollar AI company or is it just going to be Google and Microsoft are the winners? No, I think, I mean, I still believe like Mag7, I look at Microsoft. They're all platforms. I mean, they're going to be stronger and get stronger. Yeah. But there are going to be a lot of small cap, mid cap companies today that no one knows that over the coming years 
they will start to become more household names. But will will they have the opportunity to, or will app, or will Google buy them before they even? Well, I think that's why it's going to be a tidal wave of M and A, and no one. And, and the difference now, from a big tech perspective, is. Con and the FTC is viewed like a mosquito now. No one's afraid. Well, they, Microsoft beat them and acquired Activision, and now nobody's afraid to try a, a deal. And a number of other cases where yeah, they lost. Yeah. So now big tech's going to be emboldened to do M&A. And then when you look what's happening in the current smid cap, you're going to see a lot of companies either go aggressive or potentially get bought as this all plays out. And, and that's our view that you could have some bumps along the road on macro or, you know, different earnings. But if I look where the budgets are going and where the spending's going, I think a lot of these tech companies, you're going to have numbers go up 15, 20% versus where the street is. I wanted is, to ask you, 25. if IT budgets go to 8%, is that coming from somewhere else? Or is that just incremental, uh, I guess, CapEx or incremental R&D? I think half it's incremental CapEx. Okay. Half of it's coming from the hardware players. And the services. And the reason Cisco acquires Splunk, HP just acquired Juniper, is because they see writing on the wall. They see they're basically going to be shared donors unless they do something quick. What do you mean shared donors? Like people are going to spend less with Cisco and spend more somewhere else. That's exactly it. And and that's why, look, Splunk- It's a really interesting dynamic. Cisco doesn't buy Splunk if we're not talking about AI. And by the way, we just saw what happens when a company becomes a shared donor, Intel versus NVIDIA. It's a it's it's like not even close when you look at those two stocks over the last five years. I mean, you're you're talking about LeBron, okay? Yeah. Pick your Greek yeah. freak right to to some you know basically junior high school. Player. Do you have to follow or be aware of what's going on in the private markets, given that so much activity is happening All there the, with your space? Yeah, so we spend a lot of time with VCs, private companies, like in that whole community. Not, not less about valuation, more to understand the data points. Like who's winning share, who's where discounting. Like if the Josh Brown of uh, enterprise sales goes from company X to Y, to me, that's noteworthy. That's a signal because the guy, every salesperson wants to sell the best shit. As so well as where quotas them? are set and yeah, things yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so what did you see at CES that maybe either was reported in the press but not remarked enough upon or – it's just something that you were not expecting to see. Yeah, I think three things that I was not expecting to see was the level of executives there from big tech companies that don't have booths. In other words, like they just were- Just browsing, just browsing. And, and obviously a lot of people that I know there, I was shocked that they're there and why are they there? They're there to basically shop. They're looking for, they're looking for companies. They're looking for technologies. What was the coolest thing you saw? Look, I think the coolest the coolest thing I saw was X Ping because a lot of the Chinese players were there for the first time. What is that? And it's a flying car. So if you think Jetsons, two thousand twenty, and it actually works. So one of those by two thousand twenty eight. Would you get in that shit though? I wouldn't. I probably would get in. You would get in. I, I'd ac- I'd that. actually do a podcast. You would it. get in it for the gram. You I, would. I, I definitely. <laughs> I, I definitely. I I, de- I definitely would get in. All right. I know you would. Like a real flying car. Wait, like so as in like Jetsons X-Pen in real showed life. off a flying car? A flying car. Is it like a helicopter that's got a car body? Or no, it, it's a car body and then all of a sudden it goes to wind and it actually flies. But what propels it? So it, it's actually, if you look at how they built it. Don't it, say AI. No, it, it, they've they've built it in a way that it's almost helicopter-like. Okay. But it convert look, similar how like on a smaller scale, Rivian, you could get a barbecue set in the actual Rivian or- you know, oh we, shit! Yeah, there it is. What? <laughs> it, it has propellers. Yep. <laughs> what? I mean, it's kind of cool. I have to admit. Like, what, is that gonna? Actually oh, look! Be a it's thing? like the cockpit. Yeah, that's kind of. Now you're gonna cool. need it looks special like it's pl- from a demolition man or something. Yeah. Now the one thing with this is that you're gonna need special places to land it, and like you know, it's not like you're just gonna have them right. flying around. But look, who knows? 2028 future proof. We could be uh, in one of those. I'm, I'm, I'm down. All right. So the X Pang flying car. You saw executives from all over the place. You were well, surprised. all over the place on, on both on the automotive side, but especially on the software side. Okay. I think if you look at some of the AI technology displayed, specifically on what I be on some of the consumer apps, yeah. how this is all going to be built. Like from a marketing perspective, AI is basically going to transform a lot of devices. I saw somebody tweet a picture of uh, like a Samsung 
it was like a TV, but it was like see through. Yeah. So like, what is that? So what's gonna and they're they're gonna release that in the next six to nine months. So it's it's a TV. So you're watching TV. There's an image. You actually the screen goes away, and then the image is still there. But I could see you through it. So the oh, screen's except, not there. It's a hologram almost. It's a hologram almost. Okay. Very cool. Wow. And then um, I was reading about Microsoft. They have a co-pilot button on the keyboard now. Yep. And the co What's the significance of that? Because they don't make changes to their keyboards very often. Well, because Microsoft recognizes, and, and, and Nadell was there with Walmart, Microsoft recognizes that the opportunity right now is to get more and more consumers engaged on co-pilot. Now, for, for the consumer, it will be chat GPT. But for enterprises, and that this is really the big one, we believe 60 to 70% of enterprises the next two years will be going to Copilot. When you say going and, to Copilot, that means they will be clicking the box that says, I agree to incorporate Copilot in all of these Microsoft programs that our employees are already using. And what that basically means is, let's say, an organization that's, ha that's already on Microsoft, already on Azure. They're on Outlook. They're on the Microsoft Cloud. They're using Office. Exactly. They okay. have a full Microsoft shop. Now, all of a sudden, whether it's the marketing department, the finance, the legal, now they're going to have Copilot. For whatever their use cases are, they could use it. So I don't, I don't use ChatGPT. Like really, kind of ever? Do you do you get do you use it? Do I you use, use it? I use Google Bard inside of Google Docs. What are you using it for? I have it write things that I don't feel like writing. Do you use it? Well, I use it, but remember the the way most people are going to use it. It's not in the Chat GPT form today. It's That's gonna right. Be, it's going to be products. apps. It's it's also it's going to be apps are going to be developed over the coming years. If you look at Apple. We believe there's going to be a whole other app store that are going to be AI-driven apps. When they announce the AI app, the stock immediately goes up $500 billion. But right? that, <laughs> no, but that's a good I'm example. Even, I'm not even joking. No, Josh, I were talking about this. Like, somebody emailed me and said, hey, you know what? Because I was a, a little bit down on Apple. He said, you know what? You're not thinking about that nobody is. Nobody expects Apple to do anything with AI. No, that's it. That's exactly. So, but you 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 wrote Apple introduces the AI app store. You In have this June. great you have this yeah. great like wish list, a uh, ten wish list of, of for tech, and you said we believe that in 2024, Apple formally introduces the concept yep. of a new AI app store that you think could increase services by revenue by five billion dollars. What does an AI app store so mean? So right now, if you look, let's say Vision Pro, Vision Pro is the next form factor. So it's another That's form fe factor. Fe February. February that Apple's introduced. The, the average, I'll call it casual take, would be like 3,500. That's not going to move. Ne no, that's not what it's about. It's chess versus checkers. Mm. They're trying to get developers to build more and more apps for Vision Pro. Eventually, what's going to happen is developers right now, all developers are focused on are building AI-driven apps, healthcare, fitness, content. Apple's going to have a separate app store, separate part of the app store that are just AI apps. So as AI apps are built, you're going to be able to buy them on the actual app store. The other thing Apple is going to do, we believe they're going to integrate some of that AI technology into, into iPhone their own 16. Stuff. Yeah. So right now, when you look at the valuation, zero is valued. Zero. Zero. No, yeah. literally yeah. zero Wait, can for I ask, AI. Can I ask you a really naive, stupid question? Let's say they start using AI built into the iPhone 16. Why does that mean there should be a higher value on Apple stock? Because they're charging more for the phone? Okay, so that's a great question. It's because there's 1.2 billion iPhone users, and the services business today is $100 billion a year. Let's call it growing 12%, 13%. Now you're going to have just more and more monetization. That services, instead of $100 billion, next three to four years, you're looking at something that's $140, $150 billion. Going to two hundred billion. You said you think services. You, we, services. Josh and I were talking about how YouTube alone as a standalone entity is worth got you whatever two hundred whatever four hundred whatever the number is. It's crazy. You think that the services business at least you assign for Apple a one point six trillion dollar valuation just for services. Just for services. Just for services. And that's always look. I think a big part of the last like three years was because a lot of people big ah oh, growth. If you look at iPhone, you know, they haven't yeah. grown in the last four quarters. That's as you say, trees, not far. Because the margins on the services are, what, 75? They're double yeah. the hardware. They st they stopped reporting uh, unit sales. And it's 25% of the business now? And it's 25 And the other thing is, if you look at where it's all going, is that that is going to be teen growth. So it's called low to mid-teen growth. 
margins are actually expanding on the services. It's wild. So, so that, but like, that's a good example of one where it's like, if you look just at valuation, you miss underlying what's happening in the business. What do you think the vision to, obviously the $3,500 price is for a very specific audience. Developers. How quickly do you think price comes down? In two years, it's 1200 That's you, crazy. Wow. So, two, so what are you basing that on? Because that, if you look at the pattern and you look at the price points, Apple recognizes sub-1500 is where you get mass demand. Because the iPhone, is, when I say everyone will buy that, oh, everyone will buy a $1,200. Well, everyone buys the iPhone. But also, you're not, you're not paying, you're not paying $1,200 up front. You've been around so long. Can't you, like, I could write the first three months of headlines for the Vision Pro. I could literally, I could open up a doc. Is it going to be negative? Let me give you the list. I, he's, yeah. I, know, exactly. off, yeah, I, I, I know what he's going to do. I'm going to do this off the dome. Headline one, lines around the corner. Headline two, actually, it's a flop. Headline, <laughs> no, like nobody wants it. Headline three, okay, the device is cool, but the app store sucks. Headline four, <laughs> the device is heating up my temples and giving me a f***ing brain tumor. Headline five, oh, actually, no, it's not a brain tumor. Uh, it, it turns it's a out, power. It, but it's just, it's like this endless. And how about headline six, I put like 5.2 in there would be at cutting, they're cutting supply according to yes, sources. Asian supply, <laughs> yes. Asian suppliers says, totally. uh, uh, cutting back on supplying chips. And to, then you get a downgrade in there. And somewhere. then somebody downgrades it. And it's just like, I already know what they're going to do. And, Why can't they stop themselves from doing and it? And the one thing is, the like, headline writers? Look, yes, but, stop, but the one, don't do it this but, time. But also the one thing is many analysts, these are not individuals you want as your friends in junior high or high school in Long Island. The point is like, if the wind blows the wrong direction, they downgrade stock. So the point is, it's very important. I think from an investing perspective, it's like. But I'm really speaking more about tech journalists because their job is to have somebody read something about Apple that day. It's so to, much easier the quick to say the product's a flop. No one's clicking on, hey, this thing's actually pretty okay. The clickbait negative on Apple and Tesla you could fill a museum with. Right. Uh, can we do Tesla? I want to I want to get to a couple more of the Mac 7s. Tesla Outlook in 2024. I don't want to do like the typical Elon Musk stuff. Yeah. It's like, it, all right, we get it. He's crazy. Fine. You wrote, every year the bears come out of hibernation mode and think this is the year that Tesla shares collapse. Uh, the bears view it as an automobile company that should trade at a valuation multiple of GM or Toyota. The bulls, such as myself, believe it's a disruptive technology company. And that's the Wall Street con consensus view. There is a universe in which the bears are right and investors become less and less excited and the multiple just quietly uh, shrinks for 10 years. That is something mm -hmm. that could happen. Why do you think that won't happen? Be the reason, and remember, a lot of the bears, they're some of the smartest people I've ever talked to on Tesla. It just happens the bulls make money. On this one. And I think that my view there is that 3% of automobiles in the U.S. are EVs. Now, if you think that's staying like that for the next five or six, then that, that thesis is, is true. Globally, you still have 70% of automotive is EV. Americans uh, don't want these EVs other than Teslas. So to, tell me, tell to me more about so that. So to Josh's point, people don't necessarily want an EV. They, they want, want a Tesla. Tesla. And that's an important okay. dynamic. And the other thing is that from a price perspective, if you look for Tesla to make money on a car, let's just say originally, it cost 50000 to make. At, at, at one point, it cost sixty to seventy to make. Wow. That to make today is 25000 So So the difference is, is that because of their software and because of their global scale and because of the genius of Musk and their efficiency – from Austin to what we've seen in China to Fremont and around the world, they're able to produce cars at a pace and at a cost that no one else could match. And that- Well, they're not unionized. This helps. Exactly. Okay, but, but couldn't that change? I I mean, I personally, I think there's a better chance of me putting NFL playoffs and unions coming into Tesla just because- the, the Tesla employees don't want it. They don't want it. So how do, how do— Because also, remember, a lot, the way a lot— They get stock. Every Tesla— Right, they feel like tech every, workers. Every, Desla, every factory worker— they, they have, like, when I you, don't want to gloss over this. I think this is a when, huge component When you walk story. through Tesla factories, 
Yeah. Everyone feels like a tech they worker. have ownership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's like they, everyone is there. They're all aligned, which is very important. As everyone throws to the union, UAW in Detroit, the difference is the Tesla, like there have been millionaires minted on that factory line because of the stock. Right. And no one can say that that started working at GM or Ford in the last what, 30 years. What would another auto company have to do to garner that software multiple that Tesla gets? I mean, it's, look, if you think the average automotive company today gets less than 1% of revenue from software, if you look at ultimately Tesla between full self-driving, which I've used the golden goose, where it's all going to ultimately head, you know, they're going to have 30, 40% of overall revs when you look out non-auto, in other words, from software and services. That's a big reason why the multiple that Tesla is going to get, I view it more, almost, it's an ARR SaaS multiple on that core software business rather than automotive. What would you need to see out of Tesla to think like, oh shit, maybe the story is changing? Look, I think if the price, the price cuts, we think 95% of them are done. So if the price cuts just continue to accelerate in China, margins continue to dip this year, Demand started to wane significantly. They didn't come out with a sub thirty. You would vehicle. you would downgrade if you like, saw it in the data. But do you think do you think the price cuts are bullish because they're crowding out competition, or are they bullish or, or are they bearish because they're responsible? I think it was demand. a poker move for the ages. That's right. why if we go back Groundhog Day, Bill Murray a year ago. Everyone's like Tesla, this is it, it's over. And then the stock obviously it was a it was a rocket ship because cut prices because margins enable that. Them to do so that. He's to saying suffocate. You, can, you can't compete with me because I can make. I could. It costs he, me less than it costs you. He's basically saying you can't compete. Right. I'm going to cut prices, suffocate competition. Then my only real competitor will be BYD in China, and I could live with that because there's enough for both of us. Well, he's got the traditional automakers. I don't want to say on the run, but in retreat, they're now going to make less electric vehicles, and they're blaming it on lack of demand. The lack of demand is stemming from the fact that they don't make Teslas. And it's the models, right? Like right? I mean, that, it, that? It, it comes down to like, if you look across the world, they want a Tesla, not even. So I, lo I looked at the BMW, um, what is it? The MX, yep. uh, I something, mm -hmm. the the SUV, the crossover. It, yep. It's $115,000 it's MSRP. And it's, it's beautiful. I just don't think the electric vehicle buyer is the $115,000 vehicle buyer. But but that's why if you're- So who is that for? But but you're talking super high-end niche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, if you're sitting there on the LIE on a Saturday- It's just model, one of every it's model three. One of every five it. cars is a model three or, or yes. Y. Okay. All right. So you're a constructive Tesla this year. Oh, I think this is going to be a home run year because my view of Tesla this year, it's not just about units and price cuts and margin stabilizing. It's that we are now going to start to turn the corner on what I view as probably the best AI play in the market because of full self-driving. And I think that's going to be significant to some of the technology they talk about in FSD as well as battery technology. So Tesla, I don't think people realize Tesla's stock doubled in 2023. Yep. Uh, I want to ask you about how behind Alphabet really is versus consensus, which is they missed it. Okay, so it's too early to say anyone missed so a it, right? A year ago, yeah, they were miles behind. Like it was, it was jaw dropping. To be How clear, we're saying Alphabet miles behind Microsoft because remember they could have bought OpenAI sure. if they wanted to. Sure, they thought they were smartest person on the block. And ultimately, look, but the difference there is that they recognize internally. I'd say going back to maybe like May June, they recognize like, okay, we messed up. We're doubling down. We're changing course. We're going after it. And that's where everything changed. So they were very cautious. I, I think, yep. I think like Alphabet, the story is that maybe you can correct me. The story is that Alphabet hired all these ethicists and professors and um, academics roaming the halls, talking about the dangers of AI. True. Satya Nadella was on the phone, meanwhile, with uh, Sam saying, step on the gas. Because Nadella is a dog bounty hunter. Like, the point is, like, he understands where the market's going. He's not afraid to ruffle feathers. Yeah. And it's why right now they're building a statue for him in Redmond. And the point is, so that, but I think if you look at Alphabet, they quickly recognize, okay, we're changing course. Because they they realize. So five months. Five, they, and now they've narrowed the gap to a point 
where their action, when you look at cloud, it's Microsoft. It's not Amazon number two. It's actually Google, it's actually Google, Google Cloud number two, because they've to put all their AI developers on what I'll call almost a co-pilot type technology like within get it cloud. Into, right, get it into Google Sheets, get it into Google Docs, get it into all these products. Because that's the golden Sur goose. Obviously search advertising. And for them, search advertising, they're the king of the hill. No, no one's, Bing is not gonna unseat Google. Google recognized, okay, we understand that market solidified. The big market that we're going after is enterprise. You know what? You know why I feel like capitalism just works and, and why I'm such a big fan? <laughs> Google's search engine a year ago was just, it had become completely polluted. The first three results would be sponsored. The next three would be sponsored, but a different type of sponsored. Yeah. You would have to get two thirds of the way down the page to find something. And it was always a Wikipedia link or Google's own data. And I like even movie times, weather, whatever. And I remember saying, what, what the hell happened? This used to be a white screen with a box. And with AI now, I'm like hitting the microphone button and I'm saying, write a letter to, uh, write a letter to my child's fourth grade teacher named Mrs. Whatever, why he was late to school today, uh, took him to a doctor's appointment. Like a jumble of shit. Yep. They give me an email, like fully formulated. I, I almost have to spend like two seconds editing it and that's it. They are, so from my perspective, as not somebody involved in the tech, as a user, I said, all right, this is quick. Oh, and they and they quickly pivot. I mean, over the summer, yeah. there was like an all hands on deck type of pivot with an alphabet. And I think you're going to look years from now and that was that was just a move that will change the company so from an AI perspective. Year, years from now, is AI replacing people's jobs or is it just letting us do more with less? I, or what, I, what, what's I actually think AI creates more jobs in the next two or three years. Developers, engineers, mar the use cases. Now, over the long term, there's definitely some jobs that could fade away. But incrementally, I think it's making you do more in, in terms of with less from an efficiency perspective. What, one of the weakest – one of the weakest – um, one of the weakest uh, Magnificent Seven stocks off of the lows has been Amazon. They, like Alphabet, have invested in Anthropic. Anthropic has a similar janky open AI kind yep. of part of this is not for profit. Part of it is LOL. You figure it out. W what are we to make of Amazon? But Amazon's making chips, inferencing chips, training chips. Like, so they're very deep in AI. But they're not getting any credit in the valuation. But then you go back to like Jazzy's an AWS cloud guy. He inherits when he inherits Amazon. He's the new the new CEO. For, yeah, new CEO from Bezos. They were spending money like a 1980 rock star. So the first thing they needed to do was just significantly cut cost. I mean, it, the business model was upside down. Now the last call it six months, special last three to four. They're all. In, I mean, they're going to go aggressive on chips, AI develop. They're. I'd be shocked if they don't make three to four AI-driven technology acquisitions because now the rest of the house is in order. Now for them, it's making sure that Google doesn't leap them on the AI cloud side because that's really the opportunity for them from an install-based perspective. Amazon announced cuts to the studios yesterday, a lot of layoffs there. Uh, a third of Twitch staff, or not, I think a third got laid off. Google also, The Verge reported today mm -hmm. that Google's doing a bunch of layoffs. Um, do you think that these companies have sufficiently cut some of their employees, like, or is there more to come? But there's actually net hiring. It, it, like, th that's a good example. Like the headline, so the ref refocusing? Th there, it's a refocus because you look at, especially from the assistant and some of the speech stuff, the companies have recognized that's in the rear view. I mean, we're going to cut some of that staff, either redeploy, and then we are going to significantly build up in other areas. And I think 95% of the cuts in tech are in the rear view mirror. Okay. Speaking of... Uh, of the streaming stuff, um, you had a prediction that Apple is going to buy ESPN. Let's talk mm -hmm. about sports. What's what? Are, what's the thinking there? Because live sports content, that's the holy grail. And Except I, they never buy anyone. And they, the biggest acquisition they've Was done Beats? is Beats 3.4 billion. So it's, this is the one asset that's so rare 
that they could look to, in, in our opinion, acquire, especially given the Disney situation, strategic of what they would. What need if they to just do. wait five years and ESPN is worth much, much less because all the cord cutting and they start getting priced out of the rights battles versus Amazon? Like, why not just let ESPN become a shell of itself and then buy it for the brand name? What do you think it'll be worth today? I think thirty-five billion in terms of what they can get that for. So I would just for a company that generates more cash in most countries. I mean, it's something they could do pretty quickly. But the most important thing is— Dan, ES, I'm sorry. I got to dwell on this. ESPN also puts Apple right in the place that they have been dying to avoid for the yep. last 20 years, which is the forefront of the culture wars. Yep. Apple does not—I mean, even if you look at the stuff they make for Apple TV, it's so far away from anything that could be perceived as uh, risk, risque. Mm hmm they're very good at this, oh, actually. Oh, that's, that's their DNA. So now you're going to buy ESPN and you're going to have all kinds of – you're going to have all kinds of trans rights issues sure. and uh, racial stuff. And it's just – it's it just seems so alien to what Apple has tried so hard to avoid. But everything started with the MLS deal with Messi. I mean, like when they did that – Yeah. You look what that – They did do that deal. No, but when they did that, what that did to Apple TV, I mean, basically tripled the amount of users. So – they recognize like, okay, live sports content is where it's, you know, like the only way, we're not going to beat Netflix in content. We're not going to beat any of these guys from a con doing shows brick by brick. We need live sports content. So, wouldn't, and, wouldn't Netflix be a, a, a crazy but natural acquisition? But I think that was probably the biggest strategic mistake if you go back to jobs they that, that they ever, like, I, and we've talked about it, the biggest strategic mistake they ever made was not acquiring Netflix when they could have. Why do you think they didn't do that? Because I think they had a view that— That they, would have been Eddie Q and uh, the TV guys there or the entertainment well, guys there. And and then even after when they— like If you look at like what they did with Ivy and going back to the jobs days, I mean, they viewed it as like content was going to come and go— and if it ever got big, we could build it ourselves, but we're not going to pay up for content. Got it. They miss— calculated how quickly streaming and content was how, how come everyone miscalculated streaming? Like, it feels like the incumbents were so late and then they went all in as the business was declining and saturated. Like, they missed like, it both ways. But if you look at Hastings and you look at Jobs and you look at Nadella and you look at Musk, it, it's my view is like the Mount Rushmore, there's individual, you bet on them, right? In other words, like if you looked at Netflix and you looked at the strategy if you just bet on the vision and you are a believer, then that's something— No, it's that simpler than that. They missed it because it was a cannibalization of all their profits. You you told me to listen to Patrick O'Shaughnessy talk to Mike Ovitz. So I did last night. I was sitting in traffic for two hours. Mike Ovitz was the only Hollywood guy going up, up to Northern California to sit with Bill Gates. And he would come back to Hollywood and he would say, 1993, the guys at Microsoft are telling me— that music is going to be distributed over the air uh, directly to devices that are not radios. And he would get laughed out of the room. It's really, really hard for people working in Hollywood who are making money on DVDs or selling movies to Netflix later on, like Disney. Mm -hmm. Disney basically cannibalizing itself, allowing Netflix to build itself on the back of Disney properties. They're making so much money. Yep. It's hard for them to say, let's cut that revenue stream off and completely fight our profits. I, no, I totally get that. I totally get that. I just feel like by, I don't know, 2016, 2017, wasn't it so apparent that it was inevitable? But but even at that point, there were views like they would do content deals and they're like, oh my, how are you spending money on this? Con I remember Netflix, it was like they're spending $7 billion a year on content. But once you saw House of Cards... And then Orange is the New Black. Shouldn't have been like, all right, this is real. No, it's worse than that. It's NBC licensing The Office to Netflix. People watching millions of hours of The Office for $9.99 a month. And NBC being happy with a check for like $10 million. But I think Josh is absolutely right. It's all about incentives and people's self-interest. You're telling, right, you're telling people yeah. to put themselves out right. of business. Right. I want to – this is like amazing and we we so much appreciate your time today. I want to make sure we do well, some chips. It's great chip, to be here. Yeah, some chip stuff. Uh, Netflix in the last five years is up 1,400%. But AMD is up 650%. We is AMD going to take enough share to justify – 
what this stock has done? Are you bullish? Oh, I, I think, know you're not. I know you're not yeah. like all semis all the time. But what are your thoughts? Oh, I think AMD is going to be a massive beneficiary of what we're seeing in AI. They did it big at CES. From I mean, what they I've were. Read. I mean, look, and also, but this is another example. Just like you bet on Hastings, Nadella, Musk, Jensen. Lisa Su, Jensen, the Godfather of AI. Lisa Su, you're betting. Oh, you know, it's like that's one. Is like, she impressive? If she's flying the plane. I'm drinking Cabernet in 29E, watching Netflix, feeling pretty good. We're going to cut that for a social clip, and we're going to do hashtag AMD, hashtag semiconductors, <laughs> hashtag NVIDIA, hashtag uh, all, the th all the things that are popular right now. Hashtag Bill Ackman, whatever's trending. We're going to put all that. Hey, I want to ask you, um, do valuation – So, all right, so NVIDIA is a cheaper stock now than it was two years ago, which is crazy. Most people can't wrap their heads around that. But it's still not a cheap stock. AMD is definitely not cheaper than it was. Do how, like how important is it? Because these are still going to be cyclical businesses, right? But there's I get the cyclicality and shortages. You have an incremental eight hundred billion to a trillion of business. Yeah, that's new. Yeah, that's going to happen. So, so my view on it is like I get it's expensive the way we view it, or it's got. But when I look out in the next three, four, five years, you count on one hand, maybe two, the amount of companies that are really going to be the leaders in this AI revolution. That's why I just don't get caught as caught up in current valuation because when you start to sum of the parts of Microsoft, you get four to five trillion. But then you do you do put price targets on stocks. Of course. So where do they come from? How do you think about the framework some of, the of valuation? Part. My whole framework on these names are some of the parts. I basically value what I view as the growth businesses, the AI, the cloud, and put a multiple on it. And I do a best case to where I could see numbers next two to three years. And then I give a base case, which is like, okay, if that doesn't happen, here's what the stock's worth. And then a worst case is if things all go to, you know, a disaster, here's where the stock could be. And that's, and that's really, that's how I've always done valuation. You alluded to SMID caps away from the MAG7. What are the companies? I'm not. I'm not saying like, what are the stocks that will go up this year, although that would be nice. But what are the companies that investors should be paying attention to? I mean, if I was going to an island right now, let's just say Kauai. Actually, I like Big Island. How about Long better. Island? Is that Long good? Island? Yeah, I'd say Big <laughs> Island. Okay. So if I'm going to an island, it, it in cyber to me the the subsector that's going to just have a massive move this year. Yeah. Is cyber well, because already going, these stocks are already going crazy. They've already gone parabolic. But when I look at names like CyberArk, what I view Zscale, I think is one that could be up another 30, 40 percent. CrowdStrike, one of our favorites. I look at names like CyberArk, Tenable. I think there's going to be a significant amount of M and A in cyber. Yeah, I was going to ask you. There's like twelve of them publicly traded. That's not sustainable. No, I mean, especially if they're all competing with each other. No, and ultimately, I think you could see thirty percent of these get acquired in the next eighteen months because you have the four one fives that have built from a war chest, you know, PE perspective, what they've raised to look at buyouts. And outside of Bravo, no one's really done them. Then you look at the strategic; you have almost a trillion dollars. So, all right, so you got like uh, the big ones. Palo Alto is the biggest. That's a double table pounder. Double table still. It's it's a it's not it's not just the tail bowers dull with tail pounder. Okay, um, I think CrowdStrike is now by market cap yep. number two. Mm -hmm. Okay, we like that. Z Scaler, okay. Z Scaler, Fortinet, Fortinet. We actually like because Fortinet's one like they've had a few bad quarters. We actually think things are turned around there. Okay, CyberArk, you think is small enough to get bought? Oh, and CyberArk's probably been one of our favorite, and probably one of the best mid cap management Why? teams in tech, because as more moves to the cloud, CyberArk's one. They're gain they're becoming more and more strategic. And they probably have from a mousetrap perspective, especially from an endpoint, one of the best solutions out there. Sentinel One. Well, I think Sentinel One's I the Sentinel One is a high probability Nobody in knows our this view stock, that, by that, the way. that that gets acquired. They came public two years ago. Nobody has any idea what this is. And Sentinel One, ticker S. I look at Sentinel One, Cyberarc, Tenable, Veronis as our top four acquisition candidates. What's Veronis? VRNS, yeah. um, that, that, that's data security play, turnaround story, that's another one. All right, val value tech, uh, checkpoint. 
Love. Look, that's that's been our value. That's been our value name. Why is that tech. so? Why is that so cheap? Because they have a massive install base. Many feel that they're not growing, but yet. It's what is just, Checkpoint? What are they? Checkpoint do? is basically like a firewall software. Former blue chip in this space. The former blue chip Gill, who who ran and, and still runs Checkpoint. Checkpoint from a from a cash flow perspective, and actually is now seeing a renaissance of growth. That could be a stock with a two in front of it. Okay, so I, I've been following that one because it's so cheap, but then you're like, wait a minute. This is probably – the reason it's so cheap is because CrowdStrike and Fortinet are just ripping business out of it. And everyone tries to short checkpoint every quarter, and then literally that night can't sleep because the stock's going to be up another They can 4%. have a glow up. Like remember what we saw with Oracle last year? Like all of a sudden was, yeah. people were like, oh, shit, Oracle sexy. Like couldn't that and happen? And I think the other glow up. To, is, I, think, I know so you I, love this term. I now. actually love this term. Okay. <laughs> so I'm, I might start using it. I'll give no, you a copy. I want you to. Okay. I want you to. So I think salesforce.com, I think that's another glow up because what I view is like the AI story that's going to start. They have all the data. Put, salesforce They have all, all the data. data. They have all. Now, then people be like, oh, they just cut some cut because Benioff has margins above 30%. That's another one. If I'm betting on someone and Benioff's flying the plane, drinking Cabernet and 15E. Because he could stumble, but he'll figure out where he went wrong and fix it. And that's what he's done. He's, he's as done a, that already. As opposed to a lot of these other management teams where I wouldn't want him coaching my kid's soccer team, Benioff actually understands how to do it when he actually fails and creates— So as an analyst, this- though, what do you do when somebody—I'm not saying this is going to happen. When somebody like Benioff says, I'm stepping down, we have a great candidate internally, or we're going to search for a replacement— like, do you have to change your thesis on the stock if you went into it with management being so important? Def, I mean, no, I, 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 I call that like the, when when the thesis changer happens, you got to look in the so that mirror. That is a thesis changer. That's, if Benioff left, that would be a thesis changer because that's something where I view him as so integral to that story. So obviously, the the leadership at these companies is incredibly important. You mentioned Mount Rushmore a few times. Who is on your Mount Rushmore of tech CEOs? So if, uh, you, you got Nadella, you got Cook, Godfather of AI, Jensen, Lisa Su, Benioff. Dude, when Steve Jobs uh, stepped down and put Tim Cook in, that would have been a thesis changer. But, but okay, now going back to that point, because my v- Cook was so groomed under jobs, they you and also I was Cook's v- vision. Okay, not an outsider. Not just not an outsider. Cook's vision was about services and how he is was Elon rent. not on there for you. And I was going to say, and then and then probably at the top of that Mount Rushmore, Jensen is is Elon. Musk because and because my view of Musk is he's been able to build businesses that no one thought was even possible. So do you think he could save uh, Twitter? I think he's what he's going to he's going to take the outside capital app? for the super app. They take a haircut on valuation, and then he builds into a Chinese-like super app. What does the super app look like? Like, what does that mean? Similar actually? to WeChat to what we see in China, where you're going to be able to do e-commerce on it, do your ride sharing, do other types of search, do social media. It's a one-stop shop. It's a Walmart for apps. The Wall Street Journal just published a story that he's doing cocaine and mushrooms. You, you must get questions from clients like, is this a thesis changer? Look, but I view Musk on a Saturday night. Musk is not sitting in the library reading a book, and everyone recognized that. But part of his genius and part of, you know, some of his faults. If you own Tesla, if you've been a SpaceX investor, you understand Musk, and you take his genius and his asset yeah. with his failures. And I think that's just the, that's just you can't take the good crazy without the bad crazy. Yeah, but I don't think so. All right, so here's what's interesting: the Overton window has widened. From even when you and I started, and you're you're a little bit older than me, but not much. So when you and I started, if there were a story in the Wall Street Journal that the CEO of that John Chambers yeah. at Cisco was f-ing shrooming, like the stock the stock would be halted. And maybe maybe it's a, no, it's it, true. I'm, it's I'm, true. I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. even joking around. I remember there was a company called Sienna, which was the hottest uh, networking stock, like back yep. when networking was a hot category. This stock was going, it was like Michael Jordan would go up 10 points every day. They had to restate a few quarters worth of earnings. It went to zero. It's zero. True. It's true. That's not the world we live in now. It's a different world. It's a different and, world. And I think it's also one where investors have thicker skin. I also think because the social media information flow is just more known out there. And I think it's not, It's it, back then, 
there were basically, you know, 10, 15, 20 funds that could take down a stock. And I think now you've seen more of a democratization of some of these. So you would say that's a good development, that uh, investors are less sensitive to gotcha stories. No doubt. And, And I think, and that's also where social media has helped there too, where you all, and also retail has become such a bigger piece in a lot of these names where sometimes retail is I think on some names, retail is actually smarter than institutions. You know what? I'm so glad you said that. Retail investors knew the difference between Tesla and Nikola. Nicole, both were called frauds. The, the, for the short sellers that unearthed the Nikola stuff were heroes because that guy was no doubt. absolute garbage and was totally stealing and lying and manipulating the stock price. And retail... So, there was no, there were no institutions in that stock. Retail were excited about it, and then the short seller report came out, and the information in it was verified, hmm. and the guy was gone, and the stock went to zero, and that process played out the way it should have. And I, but if you look in retail, retail outside of Barron, Kathy, you know, if you are, yeah, retail has been way ahead of institutional on, on Tesla. Tesla. Yeah, I mean, it's not even a, a question. Yeah. And I think retail and a lot of these names, like from Palantir, I'd say to Microsoft a bit on the cloud yeah, right. side. Right, outside of Bailey Gifford and Ron Barron yep. and Kathy, I can't think of a fourth institution that came out and said we're bullish on when Tesla. When I would pitch Tesla in meetings, people would be like, please, you can leave now. <laughs> you, um, you, could le- door. you could leave. You could leave. Do you want a water? Yeah. Uh, there's the bathroom. Okay. So the point is like, that's how it's it's shifted from okay. an institutional perspective. Did you have fun on the show today? Oh, this was awesome. Yeah. I mean, thank you. This is such a fun time. Right. Thanks for having we, me. We're, we're huge, excited to have you on. We were so excited. We're huge fans of yours. And, uh, and vice versa. I love that you came and spoke at Future Proof. How did, how did that come together? Like, how did we get you there? Yeah, I mean, I like I was asked to speak there. And like, look, that what I loved about that, it was just further you know, just having communication with like so many advisors that have reached out, you know, over the years, over Twitter, LinkedIn. FinTech, and, FinTech and, people and are there. FinTech, I mean, you know, I've been to so many conferences over the years. Not like that. F- Future Proof is a gold standard. And to me, it's one where when I'm there, I'll tell you a funny thing, when I'm at Future Proof and I'm about to speak, you don't know if like there's gonna be like one person sit there or, you know, whoever. And, and the audience was so engaged because- it's one I was able to talk to the people that that have followed me, you know, across tech. We're gonna have you talk about AI, I hope, uh, at this year's Future Proof. I'll be there, first plane out there. I think what the advisors, it's wealth managers, and they talk to clients, and I think like what they're gonna be curious about is what does wealth management mean potentially for my industry, my livelihood. We're gonna have co-pilots, but yeah, but yeah, yeah. but also at Future Proof, there's a lot of advisors where maybe like. They're one, they're trying to change things within their a hundred percent. They like, are. Like, That's why they're there. Instead of the typical 60, 40 button, they're like, no, you got to come listen to what's happening in tech. And now it's that opportunity for so many people that maybe you know, wouldn't see that. I totally agree with that. All right. Well, we loved having you here. We end the show every week with something called favorites. And this could be books, TV shows, movies, uh, anything that you're reading, anything that you're doing, hobbies. You, t- you tell us what should the audience hear about from, uh, Dan Ives. Look, favorites. I mean, I, I love buying cool sneakers. I was Go- say Aviator Nation. Aviator Nation's one of no my doubt. favorites. No doubt. Um, for sneakers, I love I love Flight Club. Are those, uh, are those dunks? Yeah, I these are say. dunks. Okay, those are, those, those are hot. So I'm I'm big fan of just cool sort of things that maybe a lot of people won't even buy. You know, the type of thing like you'll go into a store and you're like, no one would ever buy that. Like you the would, orange sports jacket. Dan will. They're like, one dude actually bought it <laughs> and that was me. Yeah. He so, works at Wedbush. <laughs> so like he works at Wedbush and every once in a while he talks. It. I, so so that, but things that I like, look, I'm a sports nut, you know, so I just, I mean that. My, so, I saw you at a Penn State game. Uh, yeah, so, what game did you go to? So I w- we probably went to like seven Penn State games. Oh, so shit. we're All like, right. look, we are, we bleed the blue and white. We are dialed in Penn State fans. College football is a huge passion of myself. And um, look, and obviously I'm, you know, I, I just, uh, I love content, love Netflix. I read a little, but look, I just, I'm a big fan. You need to have passions outside of this um, industry. And for me, it's uh, it's really sports family. Very cool. Very cool. Michael, you have a favorite for us this week? Yeah, you mentioned it, but... 
our friend Patrick O'Shaughnessy interviewed Michael Ovitz, who is the founder of. You would CIA like you would like this. That guy is just one of the most interesting yeah. people in the world. What a career he's had. So no, really, he's really excellent. He's the good and a great investor in his own right. So he's doing a lot of venture investing now. I can't, so you know Ovitz is like much older, of course. but he doesn't want to spend time with people his age. He wants to spend time with younger people who are building companies and just like mentoring. That's great. So that's like the the conversation is half about. So so I says to Dustin Hoffman, I you know it's half that old Hollywood, and then half like he's involved in AI shit, and that's it's awesome. really no, I'm gonna, it's very I, cool. I, I'm, really gonna, I'm gonna look at that. Um, I I wanted to uh, just mention how wild this year is starting out. Like you got you got like Aaron Rodgers accusing Jimmy Kimmel of crimes on TV. Like this, you got Saban and Belichick same Sa day retiring. Uh, Saban retiring without even a farewell season. Yep. Like he doesn't want to trade jerseys with other coaches for the next year. He's just like I'm done. Well, okay. Belichick out, three NFL coaches fired, and there's a huge uproar uh over Cat Williams. Oh, Pete Carroll too. Pete Carroll's out. Pete Carroll. That was surprising. So what about Cat Williams? Cat Williams is like one of the most successful comedians of all time. Yeah. People don't even understand this. He's had 12 one hour specials. 12. Uh, most comedians get one and then never again. Um, he's independent. He goes and sells out like arenas. Like yeah. uh, uh, he's just, he's yeah. huge. I didn't really understand his backstory. He like left home at uh, 13 years old, lived, in, slept in a park in Miami, got himself onto a stand up comedy stage at like 14. And just like, he has a crazy story. Crazy story. And eventually gets himself into Hollywood in the movies. And uh, he's pissed. So he doesn't do podcasts. So he's been listening. You know, there's all these new podcasts yep. now. He's just been listening to other comics go on and make shit up about him. Or one guy said that he was supposed to have the Cat Williams role in, in a Friday movie. And he just <laughs> like, he went on Shannon Sharp's podcast and he just went crazy. It's three hours. It's in two parts. Shannon Sharp. No, Shannon Sharp. Shannon great. Sharp just like stops talking at one point, and it's Cat Williams' monologue on everyone that's ever lied about him, and he's just going in on Kevin Hart, on Diddy. On uh, it's just a, I've loved that Ro the Rob Lowe podcast has been great. The one I haven't listened to that. Like all the eighties. Like if you're an eighties guy, um, guy that. yeah. Um, in the same vein, Stephen A. Smith this morning. Last night. Last night? Yeah. Just chose to settle a score with uh, Jason Whitlock. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> so this is an, 45 minutes of unedited, unadulterated. This is this is the worst human being I have ever met in my life. That's his. That's how he opens it. No, 24 is off People to People are just, going nuts right it's, now. It's, it's, it's wild. What do you think that's about? It's in the air? I think it's in the air. And yeah. I think, I mean, like, look, I would like, and I think it's just one where, uh, oh, a uh, Ackman versus Business Insider. Oh, that's which I am paying as little attention to as I can. Uh, but like, it's it Elon, feels Elon versus Cuban, Elon versus everyone, Elon versus everyone. Yeah. And in the backdrop, you have a flying car in the, in the backdrop. So, so it's, it, we're off to a wild start for the year. Yeah. And I look, I think 24. Is just going to be, it's a wild Is there start. anyone that you would like to start a fight with right now? <laughs> We're going to give you the space to do that. If there's anyone I'd want to start a fight with today. You can come back. We could do that next I, time. I, I, have to think, I have to think about that one. Okay. Right, right now, I can't really, I can't really see it. All right. We, we, could, we, could, do, we could do that on a, on a future date. Uh, I want to thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you. We, we were so thank happy you to have here. you coming. And uh, it's just a great way to kick the year off. It does feel like it's going to be another exciting year in tech. I don't know what that means for share prices, but just in the the revolution. Get out the popcorn. So, and I love that you see it as a revolution because I do too. So oh, yeah. Thank, thank you. Dan Oz, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. All right. Just to remind everybody, uh, guys, your ratings and reviews go a really long way. We have got to trick the algorithms into thinking this is a quality show. And the, only, and the only way we can do that is with your help. So please, if you love the show, if you love Dan Ives, come on there and say, great show, give us a rating and review. It goes a long way. I want to give a special thank you to John. John, great. John has manned the show today uh, solo, and uh, Duncan, of course, is away. Duncan will be back very soon. You've done an incredible job, John. I just want to look at me. Look at me. Look at me. You. You. The talent is off the charts. Thank you so much. Rob, you were good this week, too.
All right. On behalf of everyone at The Compound, thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure to follow Dan Ives on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. No, I'm, no just, I'm a Twitter, LinkedIn guy. Twitter and LinkedIn. Follow Dan Ives. You'll be smarter. I promise you. We'll see you soon.